this is taken from Destiny's channel and it features some panels that they did at this thing called Mindfest. So some event happened, I think it's in Austin, where they invited, you know, your usual people on the internet who are shouting and screaming about trans bathrooms and whatever else they love speaking about on the internet. And they invited them all to flip in debate and whatnot. They had Alex Jones there, Destiny was there. And guess who else they invited? Brian Callen. Brian Callen, old rinky rinks. They invited that guy over there with the fucking saggy eyelids to talk about cancel culture, I'm assuming, which is absolutely hilarious considering what he went through. But um, Brian Callen was on the flipping panel talking about what he was talking about. And there's a clip here that I want to play that's absolutely hilarious overall. Um, that is really, really interesting um, considering what happened to Brian Callen and putting some context around it too. And we're going to go back and read the original article from the Los Angeles Times that speaks about Brian Callen's, you know, alleged rape allegations. But Brian Callen had a very interesting perspective on cancel culture in general and how it affects people. I thought it was very interesting. So let's play the clip. This is courtesy of Destiny's channel. Go for it. Thanks for all being here, guys. I wanted to ask, today we just have this justice system that really assumes guilt and has to be proven innocent. What should we be doing to actually get back to being innocent until proven guilty? And is social media part of that problem? Yes, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem because what happens is the minute you're... Yes, it's a huge problem. What happens is it's a huge problem. I love when Brian gets in his, like, you know, um, intellectual, philosophical, um, reflective voice thing. Yeah, it's just a huge problem. Afghanistan. You're accused of something. It doesn't matter. So uh, none of that matters. What happens is every corporate sponsor you have and everybody you Kadoosh. have business with Kadoosh. stops Kadoosh. doing business with you because they all go Kadoosh. too sticky. So that's a huge problem. So so due process is dead for a lot of people because yeah. the minute somebody comes up and says you did this and the problem with that is that that person gets a story and you get a statement and you're f okay this is a bit that annoys me he says what he says which is some truth to it there should be due process i think council culture by and large is a bit lame i understand it's kind of um i understand its function in this society or w within the current legal system because sometimes you can't you know get a conviction in court especially if it's after a certain amount of time and just in general when it comes to stuff involving rape and sexual assault and sexual harassment it's very difficult to get a conviction in the first place the conviction rates are depressingly low so i, can, I understand the function of council culture because if you can't get someone back in the courts get them back in the court of public opinion by basically shaming them right by basically shaming them into flipping um <clears throat> By shaming him into flipping, by shaming him out of existence. I understand that regard. So there's something in there to be said for it. But on the other side of things, I think if you're accused falsely, especially nowadays, considering that most of um, the consequences you face will be in the court of public opinion and less so with stuff to do with legal stuff, right? Very rarely are you going to see these people go to prison or anything. So if that's the case, you should fight tooth and nail to clear your name. The same way that Justin Bieber did. Justin Bieber's case is very unique and clearly he's one of the biggest stars in the world. But Justin Bieber had a couple of fans come out and say some stuff about him that he you know, assaulted them at some meet and greet or something. And because Justin Bieber is fairly young, he essentially had a whole paper trail of DMs and texts and Twitter DMs and Twitter posts and IG things that he basically was able to put together to prove that what they said happened didn't happen which was good, but still he fought too for now to clear his name. And I think with Brian Callan, when the allegations came out about him, he didn't offer any counter narrative or offer any evidence to prove that what those whole horde of women said, and again, it wasn't one woman, it wasn't two, it wasn't three, I think it was four overall, women came out with different accounts about, about Brian Callan. One said they got raped, but the other three basically said he was sexually harassing them or just being an overall creep overall. And he didn't provide any counter narrative. That's his fault. And on the other side of things also, think about it this way. Brian Callan at that time was friends with Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan offered no flipping platform for him to come on his biggest flipping platform in the world to speak his mind and to say his piece. So that makes me think if one of your best friends of 20 years completely, completely goes silent on you, 
for I think for like a year and a half, Rogan refused to even say Brian Callan's name. When a guest would bring up Brian Callan's name on a pod, he'd quickly change the subject and move on. He acted like that guy didn't exist when they're meant to be best friends. If that's the case, it makes me feel a little bit like, hmm, if your friends aren't standing behind you and getting behind and, and kind of, you know, supporting you and, and, and letting you say your piece and you're not going out of your way to say your piece, it makes me think there's some truth to it. And then also remember, at the time when it happened, Brian Brendan even went out of the way to remove flipping Brian Cannon's name from the fucking bio of the podcast on flipping Apple iTunes and shit. The little description of what the Fire and the Kid was. They removed Brian Cannon's name straight away, rebranded the show to the Fire and the Kids. So clearly, Brendan didn't go out of his way to defend him. Even when Brian said at the thing at the time when he got accused, oh, I'm going to go on TFATK for an emergency broadcast. I remember seeing on some video, Big Up Beige Frequency, I think highlighted it. The, the, the emergency broadcast never happened. He cancelled it completely, gadooshed it quickly they did, they did a couple episodes of some show behind a paywall on patreon but all of his friends with the exception of maybe sam tripoli who's got his issues already no one really stood up for him and said no brian didn't do it they all asked him if he didn't do it he said no but he offered no counter narrative he didn't offer any evidence that to dispute the claims and also none of his friends really went out their way to stand on it and say no the brian can that i know wouldn't do such a thing and it makes me think that there might be some truth to it. So he has a lot to blame for it. He didn't stand up for himself anyway. And now he's blaming counterculture. No, counterculture is always going to exist in some way, shape or form, especially with the way the legal system is. I think it's always going to be a necessary evil. So if that's the case and you get falsely accused, you owe it to yourself and your legacy and your reputation um, and just your family in general, looking after your fucking income and stuff, to really try and put your out your narrative out there. Also, you can't go silent. You have to attack it head on. But you can't. You can't then expect everybody else to just believe you with some like trust me, bro defense. It doesn't work like that. Fucked. So if you are in a certain industry and somebody makes an accusation about you, see you later. And it doesn't matter how old that accusation is. It could be thirty years old. But go fuck yourself because every corporate sponsor goes. I can't. Sorry. Love you but we can't do it. And that's a huge problem. So anybody thinks we still live with in a, in a society where you have, and it, what it does, it creates an atmosphere of terror. People are terrified, because I'll tell you something. Everybody's <laughs> gonna choose paying their mortgage and sending their kids to school and feeding their kids over a higher principle. So is that something to say with Rogan? Is that like a Rogan diss or Rogan enlargement? Because I can't lie, when it happened, it did kind of leave a bad taste in my mouth seeing how Rogan didn't go out of his way to defend his friends. Because I'm a big fan of JRE. I listen to a lot of it. I started listening to maybe the JRE from like episode 400 mark around that kind of mark. So I'm balls deep into flipping Joe Rogan. And he, for the longest time before now, you know, now he's kind of on, I don't know. There's many things he kind of rabbits on about, but you know, before the pandemic, one of the things he was always talking about ad nauseum was fucking cancel culture. He would always talk about cancel culture and how perversive it was and shit, right? And how he didn't like it, blah de blah blah blah. And then anytime somebody got cancelled for something in, you know, in culture or who was a part of the culture wars, you would be, you know, you could kind of guess you know, soon after they would appear on Rogan to tell their side of the story. So it really surprised me as a fan of the LA podcast scene overall from afar to see when Kalani's best friend got cancelled and to maybe a lesser extent Chris Alia, no one went out of their way to basically defend them. No one went out of their way to kind of fight against cancel culture, especially Rogan, especially when it comes to Callan. So all that stuff about cancel culture, it was easy to do it when it was not his own friendship group. But then the moment it kind of came to his own doorstep, he quickly, quickly changed his kind of tune, completely shut up shop and never mentioned those guys again. He's mentioned Callan now a few times. He's obviously had Callan on the show um, with the Fire Companion, but I don't think he's ever uttered Chris Alia's name. Do you know what I mean? So that's the thing that kind of left the sour taste in my mouth. So I can imagine what it must have felt like for Brian. But on the other side of things, I think someone said before, when I mentioned this before, that around the same time that that happened, Rogan was probably pro was probably um negotiating the Spotify deal at the same time. So it was just really bad luck in terms of Chris D'Elia and Brian Callan that Rogan was also negotiating the Spotify deal and he didn't want to fuck that up. And clearly, when the Spotify deal was launched, everyone kind of saw the sort of like compromises Rogan had to do because a lot of the controversial episodes of like Milo Yiannopoulos and a few other people were removed or they weren't ported over to Spotify. So clearly he had to give up something in order to be able to kind of get the 300 million plus that he got to license his podcast for a few years on flipping Spotify. 
So because of that, he clearly chose his family and his generational wealth over protecting his protecting his friends. And maybe that's what he explained. Maybe behind the scenes, he explained to Brian, hey, I'd love to have you on my show to defend yourself, but I've got the Spotify deal. There's three hundred dollars, three hundred million dollars on the line. This is gonna set up my my daughters, 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 daughters for you know years to come. I need to flip in, take this. And I can't be having you in the show that might jeopardize a deal. Or they just said if you have if you come on the show, it voids a contract, like straight up. That might be a thing. But again, like I said, because they kept talking about counterculture so much, you just would have accepted expected they would have maybe stepped up a little bit a little bit a little bit and kind of helped out their friends but the fact that they didn't i think says everything you need to know about it in my opinion and i don't blame people for doing that because it is that is the biggest problem with social media and i see it all the fucking time in hollywood all the time and there's no way you can fight it and also do you blame production companies a lot of these guys production companies they don't actually have an opinion or whether or not you did the bad thing they just want to protect their investment and it cost for some reason, I don't know why, maybe it's the equipment, maybe it's just the overinflated fees that people charge, but it costs a lot of money to make films. It also costs a lot of money to flip in, um, what you call it? A lot of money to do films, a lot of money to flipping create TV and all that malarkey. It just costs a lot of money. So if you're a production company and you're putting a lot of money on the line, you're booking the talent, you're putting the shows together, it makes some sense if you want to protect your investment by not having somebody on staff who has some controversies around them who maybe has done something untowards against women or whatnot it's just not good business it doesn't make any sense it's not going to allow you the opportunity to maybe recoup any of the money you spent to put the stuff into production in the first place so i don't blame the production companies or the film studios for deciding to pull the plug on people if they do get cancelled because they need to protect the investment and nowadays hardly anybody really watches tv um the way they did in the past you know viewing figures are down across the board for the most part you're competing for with for a lot of attention with different people who you know are watching different things at the same time i don't really blame them in the slightest for deciding to protect their investment and kind of pull all sort of sponsorship or whatever it may be with these people it makes complete sense and people just go yeah and everybody feels ashamed and hangs their head even when they know even when they fucking know that this person is innocent <laughs> and it could be an, so in, it could be in anything and we see it all the time and so I, I don't know what to do about that problem i really don't but until the money until corporations <laughs> go hey we believe in due process and if you believe that if you if you want to cancel somebody you're next you're next and the only thing standing in the way what? is the no we're not if you don't if you don't diddle if you don't sexually assault people you're not going to be next you're going to be perfectly fine like a lot of the stories that I put out there about these guys and girls were believable. Why? Because we've heard them speak in general about how they interact with women and how they act overall, or just we've kind of gone familiar with them as people. You can't do that amount of content done over the years and kind of hide your true nature. We kind of believed what they were kind of selling. So I think a lot of the production companies also believe the same thing. So him saying what he's saying now is really, really weird. Like really, really weird. The, the, the organization in power, which switches all the time, is going to favor you or it's going it's to it's gonna, it's gonna kind of gloss it over and move on to the next person they don't agree with. And that's the biggest threat, I think, right now. I see, I see it all the time. And I see well, I mean, too many the, people's lives get ruined as a result. The biggest one re most recently, speaking to what you're saying, is Johnny Depp. Hey, listen, man, I got a thousand friends, including myself. You know, I've, I've, I've fucking, you know, all of them, yeah. But yes. we don't we don't all exactly have the same kind of resources Johnny Depp does to fight right. back. Exactly. And that's the no, but you can still fight back. Why don't you go on your Instagram live and basically refute the claims line by line in the article and try to break down exactly what happened and offer a counter narrative? He never did that. Brian Callen never did that. He never did that. He just essentially tried to fight the defense, tried to fight the allegation with a trust me bro with a trust me bro defense and hope that people would give him the benefit of the doubt. Why should they give you the benefit of the doubt? No one knows you. Like, no one really cares that deeply, really. But if you care that deeply about your own career, your own legacy, you should be offering a counter-narrative. You really should. Thing. Exactly. And, and cancel culture is very real. And what it means is all of a sudden, you can't work and you got to sell your house and your kids have to say goodbye <laughs> to your dog because you can't find a place. I've seen this with my own eyes. But then again, 
you know, he's not selling his house. Come on, let's be fair. Daddy's got a lot of money. He's got a trust fund. He's going to be perfectly fine. He was paying two fucking mortgages, if I'm not mistaken, you know, at the height of his fucking success anyway. So he'll be fine. And the fact that he never really sounded like he had to downgrade himself in any kind of way, shape or form kind of speaks to that level of wealth and that level of privilege. Like he was perfectly fine. I think he's trying to paint a woe is me narrative. It doesn't make any sort of sense. And then on top of that, he didn't he eventually end up break, breaking up or divorcing his um baby his children's mother or his ex-wife and then he ended up getting in a relationship with another lady and having a baby with her soon after so you know somebody that doesn't have money that is struggling or has to sell their dogs doesn't you know jump out of a divorce where you're having to pay crazy amounts of alimony and child support and then go straight into another relationship it doesn't work like that so this woe is me i was so poor i was so broke thing is lies like absolute lies i don't believe it's a little bit of it so this clip i want to play this is super hilarious courtesy of the fire and the kids subreddit it's courtesy of an account um called siphon filterer and it's called a brian a brian callan example and it basically says what i said in video format in a way more succinct and clearer and shorter way it's two minutes 20 as well so less rambling than mine but it's a little video compilation that kind of gives you an idea of what I said yo big up john valdez for two dollar super chat whitney said callan pulled it out on her also exactly so you know a lot of people are claiming that he pulls out his winker on people he's claiming he doesn't doesn't offer any counter narrative or any other example you know come on brother you have to give us some something to kind of go off and the trust me bro defense isn't good enough but anyway this is the um, video i want to play for you that kind of sums up my thoughts it's a brian cannon example courtesy of the final kid subreddit from an account called siphon filterer this is pretty good i wanted to ask today we just have this justice system that really assumes guilt and has to be proven innocent what should we be doing to actually get back to being innocent until proven it's guilty? It's a huge problem because what happens is the minute you're you're accused of something, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so they, none of that matters. What ha if you're listening to this only via the podcast, essentially the same clip is playing over and there's clippings of articles that feature Brian Callan's alleged rape accusations and whatnot on the screen as he's talking about counterculture and lack of due process is quite hilarious what happens is every corporate sponsor you have and everybody you have business with stops doing business with you you're looking good though thank you um, how good and this is a clip of whitney cummings on the fire and the kid early on this is the episode where whitney talks about you know brian kellen taking out his piece inside a car the one that um the the one that John Valdez mentioned in the super chat. I mean, like 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 when my voice gets kind of gross. <laughs> I wish there was a meter of how many times Callan's. Well, she's so immune to my sexual harassment that she just rolls her eyes. Well, due process Jesus is Christ. dead for a lot of people because yeah. the minute somebody comes up and says you did this, and the problem with that is that that person gets a story and you get a statement, and you're <laughs> fucked. So yeah. sex Hold on, that's what I mean. Like. I think part of the reason why he didn't defend himself is because Brian Cannon is rich. Like his father is like a big banking executive. You know, people will go as far as saying his dad might be in flipping in Illuminati and shit, but his dad, you know, Brian Cannon's dad is wealthy, like legitimately wealthy. He worked hard his entire life in his early seventies and shit. You know, he was responsible for, I forgot what the bank was called um, in the middle East and shit. Like he's legitimately like a big dog. So, yeah, people are saying this is a CIA, uh, big up sleeping Buddha. So it makes me think if that's the case, this explains all of this. Because he's he's able to pay 20K per month alimony and he doesn't sound like he's stressing for money. He doesn't really complain about money too much. He didn't try and defend himself as bad as you probably would want to if that happened to you. I never really heard of him selling his house. I think he might have moved or whatever, but I don't. I never heard of him like selling stuff to kind of raise some funds. He still drives a Tesla. Like life is pretty decent for Brian, even though he, you know, essentially has been eradicated from ever having a Hollywood career or mainstream career ever again. And he has to pay 20K a month in alimony. That's a, a big amount. Like how much you have to make to pay 20K? Like 100 grand a month? 50 grand a month? Like how much you have to make to pay that? That's a lot of money. So maybe that explains why he didn't defend himself. He's just rich enough to absorb it. And daddy's got the money to flip him, pay the bill if needs be. 
been yeah. sexually harassing her for well since I've known you. Yeah. Since Am I allowed one. to tell the story of our how, when you really sexually harassed me? Yeah. Oh, I love I this story. Sure. <laughs> I've heard this. Yeah. We didn't hook up, but we were um, there was this place called Westwood Brewing Company right. in um, <laughs> Westwood, and it was like this really janky. Uh, we Adam Hunter used to have yes. a room there, and then you would try to have sex with those three drunk college girls <laughs> sure would. after I had sure would. after I had bombed in front of them. Hell, dirt back over here. It's only like seven thirty, and you were like, "Can I get a ride?" Turn the wheel, like. To like look where I was going, I turn around and your dick was out. <laughs> hey, the old hey, people. It was one night we kind of got together, and I go. Can you imagine that being a move? Like, can you imagine that being a move? It's already bad enough when you have to like, when you when you do unwanted. No, when you think you read the signs differently and you move to somebody and they're like not on that time at all. But just with words, like with DMs and shit, right? Where you think you read the signs like someone's into you and you maybe throw a shot and they're like, no, no, I'm not into that at all. Zero. Like, you're making me uncomfortable, actually. You're like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah? That's bad enough with words. Can you imagine in a physical encounter with somebody who you deem to be a friend at that time also, right? This is not somebody you're trying to pursue. It's probably a little bit better when you're trying to pursue somebody, you just read the signals wrong. It's still a bit weird if you say what you say, but hey, you know, chug up to the game. But can you imagine somebody you count as a friend getting into a car with them under the proviso that you're going home or you're getting dropped off somewhere and then you just pull out your piece <laughs> as a move, as like a pickup routine or something? Like, honestly, disturbing to the max. I go, look at my dick. And then probably <laughs> you were driving the but car and that night you were over it and I was probably like, I want to, maybe I can figure out a way to get a blow. So it well, wasn't when you're like that. But you're, the great thing about you is yeah. that, and I don't know if it's to um, sort of manage if it doesn't work out, mm. but from what I remember <laughs> of like kind of hooking up. And I was like, get out of my apartment. No, seriously. Yeah, yeah. I was, but probably, I, did I, was get, I was for sure trying to have sex with you. But here's friend. what I did glean is that you do not hear no a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I do know that. Yeah. Or you don't listen to it I don't listen. <laughs> that first compliment is pretty decent right you don't hear no a lot so that means you're like a good looking dude who's because i'm sure that happens as well right i'm sure in the spectrum of i'm sure in the spectrum of harassment sometimes the most good looking guys probably are the most creepiest as are the guys who don't get no action like on either ends because if you're super good looking, conventionally, like all the women, like most women would like you, but then some woman doesn't like you, it could be a real kind of ego killer. It could really kind of dent your ego. It could throw you off a little bit. And I can imagine you going to a bit of a spiral, like, you know, trying to get them to like you. Like, why, why don't you like me? Every girl likes me. Every girl wants me. And you get a bit creepy, you get a bit harassed, you get like, you know, you harass them, you start becoming a little bit too much and stuff that could happen also on the other side of the, of the end of the spectrum if you don't get no girls whatsoever you have no experience you have nowhere to calibrate your flipping you know approach and what's appropriate what isn't appropriate you maybe say stuff that you shouldn't say make people feel uncomfortable too quickly wherever you may be so i can assume that's the thing so that first compliment is a compliment also a little bit of a backhanded compliment because it's like hey you're the good looking good that, that most women like but you also don't take no well because you're used to getting yeses. But then the second thing is like you put, you don't listen to it is brutal. That second little clear up is absolutely horrible. Let's hear it again. You do not hear no a lot. Yeah. Probably I not. do know that. Yeah. Or you don't listen to it. I don't listen to it. <laughs> That's not yeah. who I am. Yeah, that is yeah. not what. That video of him at home with his eyes darting around the place, that was fright. That was a frightened guy. That was him being backed into a corner, like wondering what was going to go on. Like he was manic. That was a manic episode there. I, that's not something I could do. Those are things not never did things that I could I couldn't do. This is not thing. Okay, but who are you texting? Oh, oh! Tricks! I'm sorry, dude. Man, you don't have to shout it. Oh, all right. Tricks! Ah, it's obnoxious the way you wind up, bro. <laughs> that is not how I have ever lived my life. <laughs> Anyway, fantastic um, compilation. Uh, big up the flipping uh, Fire and the Kid guy who put that together on the subreddit. Appreciate you for doing that. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. It is called, it's on the Fire and the Kid subreddit. You can find it yourself. It's called the Brian Callen, a Brian Callen example. Sorry, it's called a Brian Callen example. It's by this user called Siphon Filter. So check it out if you haven't already. You can see it for yourself. It's available right there, right now. 
go and find it do not delay if you want to check it for yourself